So John, you've just done a, a 30 mile training right? how are you feeling? Yeah, pretty good mate, Yeah, nice and uh, tight and uh, hamstrings burning, ass is on fire, so yeah, I'm, I'm feeling good. <laughs> you've, you've got to get through 350 odd miles up to Paris, just tell us a little bit about the ride and, and why you're doing it. Yeah, so we're going to we're gonna take four days, um, well our target is to take four days to cover 350 miles um, as we leave Rosliston Forestry Centre, um, heading for the Grand Palais um, on the uh, Champs Elysees in Paris, um, calling through Oxford and then an overnight stay in Newham. I'm doing this all really to to raise money to find a cure for, for cancer um, after obviously my experience in 2011. Um, and yeah, for afterwards, nice little challenge. So why not 350 miles and heading for Paris, you know, um, so it sounds, and uh, you seem very excited by it, clearly that wasn't the case throughout the, your, your time while you were on treatment. In 2010 you found out you were about to have your, your second child, uh, and then you got sort of struck with, with what was pneumonia at the time. So just just take us through the journey from, from what was Christmas 2010 all the way through to... Yeah, the so Christmas 2010 came around and I was quite, you know, struggling with chest infections and coughs and colds and... Um, at the time, couldn't shake it, couldn't explain why, why I was so poorly and, and it actually came around that I ended up with pneumonia and um, got uh, admitted to hospital at Burton's Queen's Hospital um, with pneumonia, which was what they thought and um, I remember sort of the second day that I was in, or the, the day after being admitted to Burton's Queen's Hospital lying on this bed and this this doctor coming around to see me and actually saying that if we didn't get this guy down to um, theatre and drain the water off his heart in the next 30 minutes he might not be with us so it was you know pretty serious and um, got my uh, got the water drained off my heart and there was over a litre and a half of fluid resting on my heart at the time so it was pretty serious and you know um, I was really thankful to those guys for sort of making me feel a lot better at that present moment as it was though, it brought about a new sort of challenge and they found a tumour, um, which they weren't sure what it was and um, decided that the best method was for me to go to Stoke um, University Hospital and have a biopsy um, so they could really have a look at what this lump was and what the tumour was and, and so off I went to Stoke then. I spent two nights in Stoke, got the biopsy done, uh, managed to get back home and see my family and sort of waited then for the news of the results really. Um, Got a phone call from a local GP, Dr Skinner, I uh, went down to see him and I remember it was January the 19th, um, just after Christmas and I remember going in to see him and there was no easy way for him to really tell me um, what was happening and I remember him just saying you know, that he was really sorry and that the lump that they found was cancerous um, and he, know, he knew more, no more detail than it was cancerous and you sort of sitting there and this doctor said these words and I remember the first thing popping into my head being right okay so what do we do now um, let's get this treatment underway let's get this battle started and let's get going and um, he sort of said to me look you need to go to Derby Royal you need to get admitted there you need to get straight in so we was sort of back home and it was kind of hard in a way I remember sort of breaking down coming out of the hospital out of the doctors trying to sort of think how I was going to tell my sort of fiance and my um, four-year-old son, you know, this news, you know, it's not the sort of thing that you drop in everyday conversation or just been to a doctor's got cancer. Um, so yeah, it was kind of tough in a way, tough on all of us, you know, my dad and my mum and, and my fiance and, and son as well. But, you know, we sort of, we attacked it with a positive mind and a positive attitude and, you know, we sort of were ready for what was coming in the next sort of couple of months. So. Yeah, Christmas 2010 will never be forgotten, um, not necessarily for the right reasons, but again, you know, we, we really pulled together as a family and it was nice, you know, that everyone was around and not just family but friends as well, the support network that I, I developed and I had was just massive. So, so there's clearly really quite cool. quite a lot of people that have helped you out, which is great, you talk about these youngsters, the two, three, four year olds having to go through the same process, and most of us are probably going to have... Uh, touch wood, you know, man flu is the worst thing that we've ever come across, which for most men, if you get man flu, it's uh, it is literally the worst thing in the world. So yeah, yeah. just describe to us actually how bad it is, you know, what's the worst feeling about your treatment and, and the whole process, and, you know, for, for a lot of us, as I say, we, and fingers crossed we'll never have it, but just describe to us how bad and how bad you did feel as you Yeah, so, I mean, everyone's different and everybody's body's going to react differently and obviously where, where their tumours are and lumps are. Um, 
I was quite unfortunate that my tumour was resting sort of on one of the, the sort of pipes going into my heart and near my lungs as well. So at the time it was quite difficult to breathe and it actually came when I had my first lot of treatment in the first couple of days that it made me feel so much better because it seemed to automatically reduce the lump that was pressing on my heart. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the chemotherapy is not nice stuff. Um, totally rips your body to pieces. I remember sort of a number of days where you're sort of looking at food and, you know, there's no taste to it, there's no flavour, there's, you know, it's literally just mush going in and the worst thing is you know for a fact everything that's going in is coming straight back out and I think, you know, everyone goes through it when they have the chemotherapy but to lose your hair as well, you know, it's sort of 20... 6, 27, you know, you can sort of shake it off and make it look cool like I did. Um, but, you know, to lose your hair is quite a horrible thing when you go in the shower and you're drying your head and all of a sudden, you know, most of your scalp and your hair is just dropped on the floor. And we can quite, you know, they're the sort of little challenges you face day in, day out, losing your body hair, losing weight, you know, not recognising yourself. And I remember um, seeing a friend from school um, during a break from treatment, you know, when... She walked straight by, you know, and I remember then seeing her, um, speaking to her on the phone, and, you know, so I went past her the other day, and, you know, she just didn't recognise me at all, and I think that was the worst thing, that people just didn't recognise who I was because of the amount of weight and what the chemotherapy did to my body. But like I say, it had a great effect because it made me feel better, um, but the things that it did do were, were quite nasty and horrible, and you go through this phase as well called neutropenic sepsis, um, which is basically where the you have your blood cells drop right to level zero. Um, you end up with chills, um, temperatures of 39, 40 degrees, you know, and you're absolutely burning up but shaking because you're cold and you're stuck in bed for two, three days with being pumped full of antibiotics to make you sort of come through. And yeah, remember those wanting those sort of days to be over really quickly. Um, and, you know, at the same time, I good motivation with my little boy, you know, seeing his face and sort of using him as a real sort of method to spur me on to make sure that I could pick him up again and be with him and spend time with him and obviously see my, be there at the birth of my daughter as well. So yeah, it was it was hard, it was a hard time to go through treatment, um, but again, it's one of those, you don't really know what's going to happen, so you just get so on you talk about the strength that you've, you've pulled from your son and obviously a lot of mental uh, preparation and, and toughness that you need to have. Was there anything that really frightened you about it in terms of possibly not seeing any of your, of your children? Or... Yeah, I think so. I think there was a couple of occasions where you sort of, you know, you see how real it was and, you know, like I said, I met a lot of people in hospital and was lucky enough to meet a lot of people that won their battles, but also met a lot of people that lost their battle with cancer and, you know, it's those sort of times that, you know, really scares you and actually makes you realise what's going on here and the sort of reality of it um, and how so serious it is. So are there any real low points that you can sort of pinpoint where you think that was a low point? And, and equally with that, what, what were the high points throughout the, the time? Yeah, I think, I think really, you know, probably <coughs> just after halfway through going through my treatment, I remember um, the way it used to work, I'd be in hospital for three weeks at a time and then be um, home on leave for a week. Um, I remember being halfway through and coming home and literally... Um, you know, breaking down, you know, in just complete tears that I couldn't fight anymore and I couldn't do it and it was just too difficult, you know, and I remember sort of sort of spending time with my dad and, you know, Vicky and really getting them to sort of motivate me and, you know, it must not have been easy for them to see me in that state, but, you know, it was just so tiring at times to go through that that process, you know, time after time of going into hospital, come home, you know, and constantly fighting and not feel like you're winning. You know, that was the hardest thing at times, to not actually feel like you were getting any further forward because the way your body felt. Um, and I think, ultimately, the biggest high point was, well, there's two, really. The day that they let me go home and I wouldn't have to go back for any treatment, that was probably the biggest high point. And then the day that the doctor said to you, you know, your scans are back and, you know, I can tell you that you're in remission. You know, when he says those words to you, you're in remission, you've got the all clear, just the relief and the weight that dropped and it wasn't just the weight that dropped for me it was for everyone you know my family my friends and colleagues as well you know to for that news to come through was just such a was overwhelming really you know and I remember sort of not being able to stop smiling for most that day and being on a real buzz and a real adrenaline rush just because of what had happened really. You mentioned a minute ago about the weight being lifted off 
off the family when, when you were told you were out of remission, you lost a lot of weight throughout your treatment as well. Does that mean that you're now an ideal size for a cyclist? Not quite yet. Uh, probably need to lay off the Domino's vouchers a little bit more and stay away from KFC. Um, but yeah, probably not yet at the right ideal weight. No, I won't say I'm going to get down to Bradley Wiggins' weight, but you know I'm, you know, would like to get a little bit slimmer. So it's Burn Paris, two charities. Uh, just briefly tell me quickly about the two charities and why you chose them to, to be part of this program. Okay, so I mean, when I chose the charities, the idea was that what I wanted to do was not necessarily provide money for treatments, but actually look to raise a cure. You know, and look to raise money to support support research into a cure. Um, so I chose leukemia and lymphoma research, which was a bit of an obvious choice with having a lymphoma myself. It was kind of like seemed like the right charity to choose, and the, the things that they did were amazing. Uh, they've got two great patrons in, um, and ambassadors in Ian Botham and Jeff Thomas, um, who both do fantastic work for the charity. Um, and like I say, it's all about research, finding new cures for these blood cancers, and hopefully beating blood cancer and, and putting a full stop to it. I then chose cyclists fighting cancer because while I was sort of looking and trawling through the internet, I managed to find a site with a guy called Mike Grisselway who basically had the same lymphoma that I had, beat the lymphoma, and not only did he beat it once, but he went, he relapsed and beat it again. So he went through the process twice, um, and he then decided to train um, and do a triathlon, and. He then set up this great charity where what they do is they provide bikes to kids that are under 16 that are being treated or have been treated with cancer to help them recover or aid recovery and it's just such a great little charity, Cyclists Fighting Cancer and the things they do um, and it just seemed a nice way to put money back in and help other people and other cancer so recoveries. So less than a year ago you came out of remission, by the time you get to Paris it will be less than 12 months. How are you going to celebrate the achievement from, from less than 12 months you have cycled over 350 miles? Oh, I think I'm, I've sort of tried to play this scene through my head, you know, a number of times riding under the Eiffel Tower, you know, chariots of fire on in the background, that sort of thing. But I don't think, you know, anything will be able to describe the relief that I get when I get there and knowing, you know, that all of us will have ridden, you know, that great distance and completed that challenge. and if we're going to make a huge difference to other people's lives, you know, and I think that's the most fulfilling bit is about it, is that it's not about us, it's about other people and about helping other people and, you know, making sure there's more John Widdersons in the world and more people to tell their story and what they've gone through, really. Uh, I know that you've put a, a stack load of work into to making sure that the ride happens and all the charity events. Um, clearly you'll probably have a rest after Burn to Paris. Is there anything else in the pipeline for John Willis and what's next for you? Well I reckon you know, there's a couple of things going to look at. Maybe coast to coast, John a Great Land End. Maybe go over to Paris, uh, to France and do one of the, the coals out there. You know, follow one of the Tour de France routes. Who knows, you know, the, the future's sort of bright, the future's orange. But I think first of all, um, a certain someone uh, wants to get married. So I think that could be the next thing on the horizon, mate. So, so exciting times for, for you coming up. I wish you all the very best for, for yourself and Vicky uh, with, the, with the imminent wedding that's going to happen and certainly for the over 300 miles and the four days worth of cycling you've got to do. So good luck with it. Cheers mate, thanks very much.